So I started making music under the name Narcissist. I was in a group called Euphrates, which was me and two of my brothers who are also of Iraqi origin. Though I was from Basra, they were from Baghdad and Najaf. Um, or our parents were. We met here in Canada and we both sort of discovered, you know, Biggie Smalls and Lauren Hill and all these artists together. So that part of our consciousness and understanding of self um, came through reflections over albums, which to me was very interesting because though one of us had a more uh, religious or, you know, the presence of Islam what, and the, and the, the, spirituality of Islam was very present in one home. It might not have been the same in another. So the, the one that bridged our co consciousness and our spirituality together was hip hop in a way. And if you, if you look back, you know, one of the classes I teach in, in, my, in my Bigger Than Hip Hop class is the, the conversation between hip hop and Islam. I don't like to say that, you know, Islam birthed self-consciousness in, in hip hop. I don't think that's true. I think hip hop had a already, um, it already had a, a, a tone and a presence that was anti-authoritarian, anti-system, anti-colonialist in its birth because of what was necessary for it to be born. So that sort of um, spiritual over physical existence, like, uh, you know, Dean over Dunya exists in the core of what hip hop is as a, as a culture. And that's what I think attracted me before I may have discovered Muslim artists what attracted me to the music. And eventually, as you know, you listen to NWA and it might be this surface experience of Compton, it's actually an invitation for you to empathize with people that might be going through an extremely different struggle than you are, right? So when we first started making music in the early 2000s, um, it was 2003 when we put out our first album and being Iraqi, 2003, in North America, I was 21 at the time. You can only imagine what the music was about. You know, I'm currently wearing my Rockefeller t-shirt, which is still an ode to that era of when I started. And really, I'll talk about this t-shirt and why it's important, but it, the, 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 the niya that we had with the music was never to become famous artists. It was always like, if I'm going to occupy a certain space with our music, what is the intention of why I'm creating this music and what is my purpose within the culture? Because at the end of the day, I'm a guest in the culture. I'm a, you know, my ancestors were very much involved in the um, enslavement of people that created the birth of America, which created hip hop, right? I'm from Iraq. I'm from the south of Iraq. You know, uh, a majority of the slave trade that went through the Arab world was where I'm from. So I immediately had this self-awareness of, um, you know, what if my great, 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 great grandfathers were involved in, in these exchanges? You know, what is that? What is my karma, if you will? What is my energy that I must give back to a culture that has created a space for me to express myself? And in the early 2000s, as an Iraqi in North America, it was very easy to get press, but it was never easy to get press for our music. Most of the time when people covered us, it was because of where we were from and what we represented, which was the antithesis of what was on the news every day, which are angry, aggressive Muslims or rich, you know, male oppressive Muslims in the Gulf countries. Uh, we were different. We were North American. We were rappers. We were we believed in Allah, but we also believed that the law was crooked in the countries that we lived in. So it was like this. Um, very self-aware position that we were in right away. And then when I went solo and I started recording music uh, as the narcissist, it became very different. I was touring. Um, it became a form of, um, I started seeing that in the music game, there was a form of idolatry that, that I'm not very comfortable with as a human being, you know? As much as I grew up watching MCs and, and adoring what they do and, and looking up to them and idolizing them in a certain way, um, the deeper I went into the music industry as an individual, because I roll with my DJ, but a lot of the times when you see me, I'm alone. You know, I don't carry a crew with me. I don't really have, um, I don't really have like protection in the game. So I'm a 
again, I'm entering, entering an industry that is very much against what we stand for as, uh, as a people and what we've been through as a people. It's an exploitative industry. So I made a very, uh, you know, I don't know how many artists there are in here, which I'd like to ask a couple of questions to people that are in the room, but um, I started viewing the industry very differently and realized I want to stay independent at a young age. And I've been independent this whole time, my entire career. Um, now I've been making music for about 15 years. I've put out albums on my own. You can find them online if you look me up, look up Narcy. Um, I've been doing my own videos, funding my own work, and finding ways to navigate even these platforms that might not agree with a lot of the politics and actually censor things that we believe in from celebrities. You know, whether you think about Rihanna being censored for saying Free Palestine or, or just the truth being removed from the platforms that we put our music on um, and finding new ways to get the music out. I would say my main... Um, give back from the 15 years of me being a musician on my own and surviving off my music is that you can do it your way. You just have to rethink what success is to you and what your intention is with your work. Approach everything with intention. Just like when you come into prayer and you have an intention before you do your salah or at the end of your salah with your dua or whatever it is, I think you have to approach music and creativity not all the time, but in the same way. Because growing up listening to Eminem or artists that started ended up, ended up being blamed for violent occurrences because the people that enacted that violence utilized that music as a vehicle of, of um, empathy again and relation. Um, and the artist saying, I didn't have a responsibility. It's all about how you guys raise your children. I'm a, I don't believe that. You know, I think we reverb our actions reverb all over the world and if we as artists don't carry ourselves with a certain sense of responsibility and it's not for everybody but i think islam gave me this it, it it made me you know being a muslim made me realize the value of everything that i do and the heaviness of everything that i do but also the lightness of everything that i do so i am i infuse that in my work and i ask myself is this, do I want to take this money? What's tied to this money? Do I want to take this opportunity? What's tied to this opportunity? Who am I speaking to? When I put out a visual into the world, what am I saying to people? And what's the, you know, what's the intention behind the album that I'm putting out? So that's me in a nutshell. Um, and like it was said, you know, I will be doing a song at the end of this. I, I, will, I will rap. I will indulge you in a bit of rap. And I would love to also talk to people. I know we have about like 20 minutes left. So um, I was going to start by sharing with you guys that I have a book coming out soon. And uh, it's not in stores yet. It comes out in October. But this book, the cover was designed by Sax Afridi, who is an artist um, in New York City of Pakistani origin. He works a lot with space and Islam. So he created the idea of the space mosque. And he also did the artwork for my last record, which is uh, called Space Time. So he takes images of mosques and turns them into spaceships. Amazing artist, Sax Afridi is his name. I'll type his name in the, um, in the conversation here. Um, so this book really is about, ironically, you know, I've been sitting at home for close to six months now, like all of us have been. Um, you know, I've developed a new liking for food and, <laughs> and kind of uh, taking the time to enjoy the small moments in life. And I was running for 10 years, you know. Um, and while doing all my work and touring and kind of being on planes for, I would say, you know, at least two days a month, two entire days a month, I was writing a lot on planes. And, it, and I obviously couldn't write like I write in the studio to my music. So I was writing these reflections on nationhood, on belonging on uh, on identity, on, on my relationship to all the, the platforms that I speak through, but all in poetry form and short story form. So I wrote this whole book on my phone. Now, how many people in here love and hate their phone? You can put your hand up if you agree with me, right? Um, so I'm going to read you guys uh, the intro to my book, and I urge you, you know, to go pre-order it if you want to read it. It has some amazing artwork by artists like Khaled al and Sundas Abdul Hadi. 
Um, it has a, a comic book in the middle of it, which is based on my album, World War Free. Um, you know, it's not very detailed, but it's a, it's a mix of kind of a, a diary uh, of poetry, as well as a um, creative piece with uh, a group of Muslim and Arab artists from around the world. So. False start. Beginnings always dictate endings. In the memory of the forgotten, like a book in need of mending. A false start. Young boys and girls trapped in Walmarts, our consumer interim camps. A friendly family reminder of discounted freedom. You don't see what the internet can't. Not our land or home, not your mans or homes, not your towers or domes, not your power or drones. False start. Between two eras, error and affirmations, the karma of America meets effort. Confused about where I stand, I fall for myself every time. Misjudgment of my own eyes, I just don't see them anymore. It is quite clear that we were meant to be this way. No structure, no sentence bleed, an endless day. A sunrise forever a forever set in sun setting. We mistook the moon and sacrificed our star. It wasn't even that hard. I'm not in the moment anymore. We dwell in the past together in regret to a future filled with anxious balloons floating. It's very easy to lose touch when you have something else in your hands. Bury the galaxy in your heart. I will follow you there. This is love, a present together. But I am too selfish to believe I stand for the people, too concerned with getting balder than an American eagle. I love me a nice textile wool of the sheeple, pull on a reefer to refuel, read bulletin previews. So nice to tweet you, he said, don't mind if I G, full of wit and deceit too, those are warning signs of the evil. You bleed through me like IVs, the nightmare of my dreams. I can barely stare at you either, you always make me feel see-through. Like doubt to believers, filter my face to your taste. You stare back at me with your one eye in pity tracking my place. The light of your dark in your mind, impossible not to hear you erase me. Who knows what you know of my children, my family, my thoughts, my preferences and self-references. I will not allow myself to fear you. With you, I can reach everything and everyone except myself. So the opening of this book is dedicated to my phone and where I do most of my art. And I think it's fair for us to acknowledge that we're currently in a position where this time at home and sitting idle is making us really rethink everything that we do in our life or everything that we have accomplished. I myself have been thinking a lot about the platforms of, in which people consume my music where I lay my artwork and leave it forever. Um, and again, thinking about my phone and this, this item that kind of tracks me and follows me everywhere. And how these are reflections of good and evil and the decision we make and, and how important it is for us to think about how we make art. So my secret is, when I make my art, whether it be my music or a writing a book or merchandise or anything that I put out into the world, there has to be two elements to it for me to feel like I'm confident with it. One of them is the element of nostalgia. I think being Iraqi, um, we had this romanticization of our nation, as I'm sure many of us in this room that come from countries in the East or even living here in Canada, we have a romanticization of where we are from. Um, so nostalgia is very important. So a lot of my work will have references to the past in a, in a futurist sort of outlook. The second one is that it has to reflect these anti-colonialist beliefs that have been present throughout all my work because that's the only way I've been able to survive in a world that's built on that structure, which we can all see that structure is being 
in question by many people in the streets protesting in America, let alone the way that our countries might be handling something such as the coronavirus and how it's affecting our economy, you know, as artists, as people. So the Rockefeller shirt is that. It's a, it's a, a pull from hip hop culture, from this famous Rockefeller Records, which is a super capitalist platform. One of the biggest artists in the world, Jay-Z, built his foundation off Rockefeller Records, right? And Rockefeller Records was very influential on me as a youth. But as I grew up, I started realizing what the value of what I do is. It's not monetary. It became a Rockefeller Records. So when somebody wears this T-shirt, it triggers a lot of different conversations. It can start the conversation of the complicity of many of the countries and the money that we paid to our countries that created the destruction of a country like Iraq, of the infrastructure of Iraq. Um, or how Iraq is kind of the counter culture to America, but also how they can exist together in one person, such as myself and this t-shirt, right? So if there are any creatives in the room, I'd like to open up the conversation to you guys. We have about 10 minutes. I'd love to talk for five, six minutes before I play the video um, for you guys and share the video with you. So if anybody would like to chime in, has a question or wants to have a conversation, please feel free. So for, if you guys have any questions, raise your hand and we'll pick you on your, you and you can ask your question directly to Narcy, or you could put them in the chat and I'll read them out um, any way you'd prefer. So now is your time. Um, okay, I have a question from the chat from Matt Hearn. Um, he asked, you have written about being a father in a diaspora. How has that changed your music? Oh man, when I had my son uh, seven years ago or, or my wife had my son and we, we raised him together, um, you know, again, it reinforced the, the importance of uh, being um, aware of what I do, you know, and what you share with kids because kids are like, they're like sponges. Anything you put in front of them, they will learn. And whether it's good or bad, they don't necessarily differentiate, right? So what are we putting in front of our children and what are we sharing with our children? I think that's something I share uh, that, that really became even more important in my work. And they're my a &Rs, so they pick my beats for me. They, they know. If something hits my kids, I know it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, someone who's like lived all over the world, like what's your relationship like now with cities like Dubai, with Basra, with Montreal? I mean, with my, what I like about Montreal is that I can be fully myself here. I can be very honest in certain contradictions that I might have, but also about the contradictions that exist here. And you can have those conversations. And, and being in Canada, I feel like we are on the cusp of really addressing the problems in our country. Maybe not at the top scale of the government, because at the end of the day, when you work within the structure, it's hard to not be corrupted by it. But at least between the people where we have an awareness of self and you know, just doing land acknowledgements at the top of our events is something that not many countries do, right? So we have this awareness of history and where we're standing, what ground we're standing on. Um, with Places like Dubai and the Gulf, you know, I very much feel like a visitor. Like, although it's embraced me, uh, I, I have a lot of issues with the positioning, the geopolitical positioning of certain actions. But, you know, it's not where I'm from at the end of the day. My parents don't, like, we don't own a passport. It's not an Arab country that we belong to, and it's a very exclusive club. You know, that's what it feels like, right? And then with Basra, I haven't been back to Iraq in decades, so... You know, I have a strong connection culturally within my home, generationally within our families. And, you know, I'm married to an Iraqi as well. So it's very much present in our life. Um, but I haven't been back, although I'm in touch with people on the ground. So I have a very, very like um, contentious relationship with home. I don't feel like I belong anywhere. I belong in Zoom. So I've been in these boxes for the last couple of months. As someone said, the R.E.D. music video was shot in Bukap, Cape Town, which is the home to the oldest Muslim community in South Africa. How did you find the experience of filming on that location? So 
a very interesting story about RED, which I think I'm going to show that video at the end of this as opposed to my other one. I feel like the other one is a bit inappropriate for, but, but you guys will see it next week. Um, the day we landed in South Africa, was the, it was the first place I've been to in the continent of Africa. So, you know, I, I was very humbled by the life or the universe allowing me to visit South Africa, let alone to go meet one of my, you know, favorite artists, but also someone who became my brother, Yasin Bey, also known as Mostaf. But we slept that night and then we woke up the next day and the next day, Muhammad, Muhammad Ali transitioned, Allah um, And my friend who was flying with me or flying to me, we, he was the producer of the music video. When he hopped off the plane, he was wearing a Muhammad Ali shirt. It said Muhammad Ali on it. So that morning, Yasin called me and said, you know, Muhammad Ali passed away. And I didn't know about the importance of Bukap. When I researched it, I initially researched it because I found a mosque there that was very present that we could get in contact with, but also the homes were so colorful. I wanted to shoot in this very colorful environment. And it just happened to work out that, you know, one of the Muslimist rappers out there and me <laughs> ended up filming a music video on this area. Um, and uh, I can't explain it to you how much the spirit of Muhammad Ali guided us throughout that experience. You know, when you go out to shoot a music video, you don't really have control over things that are, you know, you're visiting a city or a visitor. So I was at the helm of the production company. And when we got to the mosque, they said to us, you can only shoot on the street where the mosque is. You can't go inside the mosque and you can't go on the side streets. You can only shoot on the front street, which had the colorful houses and then the mosque right in the middle of it. And then we were planning to go shoot in a corner store there, which are made of old crates, like um, shipping crates. And we couldn't, because the sun was coming down so quick, we couldn't catch up to the light and we didn't have a lighting team with us. We were kind of, so we had to follow the sun and we ended up hitting the corniche. And you'll see when I show you the video, there's a scene where we get picked up by the water. And um, the next day when we did the second day of shooting, I went and got the newspaper because it was dedicated to Muhammad Ali. And um, they said that the last day Muhammad Ali was in Cape Town, he prayed at that mosque that we shot in front of and then walked to that rotunda on the corniche to watch the sunset. So, subhanAllah, that to me was, the purpose of my trip was, it was bigger than us. It was Allah bringing us all together for this moment, which grouped, you know, Black America, Indigenous America, and Iraqi North America in one song. And as we were wrapping up the shoot, I went by the water to just touch the beach and there was a man there wearing a Montreal Canadian shirt with his son playing football. And his son's name was Muhammad Ali. I can't make this kind of stuff up. So it was very magical for me, you know? Um, how has hip hop influenced you as an Iraqi artist in terms of addressing the social commentary? If it wasn't for hip hop, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing and I wouldn't have any platform, however big or small it is, um, to share with the world. And, uh, I, I owe hip hop a big, big, which is why I teach, because I feel like it's my give back. Putting the culture in an in a institution in the city is my give back to the culture, you know, and speaking to 200 to 400 students um, a year.